I like that sound, Frank. It means we're on again. Real talk. We're on. Episode 9, Brad. How are you? My gosh, that means you've been doing this for a couple of months. How are you today? Very, very good. We have an exciting subject today. Yeah, I'm excited because we want to look at bridging personal and professional development. And one of the things we've been considering is this idea of personal leadership. And I've been thinking about when we lead ourselves, where do we start? Because not all of us will end up in leadership positions. Not all of us aspire to be a leader of a group of people. And yet some of us maybe found we were leading, you know, school football teams when we were nine or the orchestra if we were playing a musical instrument. So this is on my mind a lot, this idea of leadership and what is my leadership signature when I walk through a room? How do I hold myself? How do I come across and, and how do I navigate being a leader when I'm not a leader in, say, a work position? And for me, it kind of raises this question of are there certain behaviors that we could explore, maybe unpick together, that could help others watching this really learn for themselves how to truly develop into a leader. And I was thinking maybe the starting point is this idea of we need to be able to enable ourselves, we need to be able to challenge the process that we're involved with, and we need real clarity to lead with a, a moral compass to really know where we're trying to go. And so I thought maybe this would be a nice entry point for our conversation today of how do we kind of unpick where do we want to go and how do we lead by our own examples? Brad, I think this is a wonderful perspective to have because I think over the course of you know, your career, maybe when you're younger, you begin to read and absorb content about leadership, but it's almost always about you know, how do you lead others. Mm -hmm. And then later, maybe you struggle doing this because you have not applied this for yourself yet um, enough. So I think there's a component of you need to be able to lead yourself because also life for you is hard in a way and it needs decision, it needs it needs um, direction, it needs, uh, you know, a compass also in order to know, for you to know where to go with yourself. So it's wonderful that we're talking today about this. And I would say, let's start really about how do I gain the, the clarity and moral compass on where do you even want to go? How do you make this moral compass? Now, let's first, let's first ask the following question. In your point of view, the moral compass, what's its job? What does it do for you? Uh, I think this is a critical question, right? Because for me, the moral compass is my decision-making parameters. If I have a moral compass, decision-making is much easier. It shows me where the lines are in the sand, the lines I'll cross or I won't cross, whether that's with friendship. So what will somebody need to do for me to not want to be friends or what draws me towards someone to want to be friends with them? It's the same for relationships. What are the behaviors that people exhibit that would draw me towards wanting to develop relationships, whether they're friendships or intimate relationships? It's about how do we grow our, you know, our children? What do we teach them? Uh, so for me, this idea of what a moral compass does, the idea of what are your values, and by the way, not everybody has the same values. That would be simply ridiculous. But are those values helping us make our decisions and make those decisions that are healthy for us, respectful of others? And in a way, for me, this is the, the foundation of how we lead ourselves. If we don't, when we look at ourselves, realize, actually, <laughs> Frank, I don't think I've got any values then you can't maybe even be leading yourself because we need this set of principles, if you like, to start making those decisions that enable me to take leaps and bounds and steps forward um, to build those relationships, to come up with ideas, to have friendships, to know who not to get involved with. For me, it, it spir everything spirals straight out of 
what are your values? What is the basis of how you make your decisions? Is it for you the same or, or does it look a bit different? I would even go a little bit further than what you just said. So I have a statement and then a question. So the statement is, I think what it also does is allows you to take decisions when you don't have enough information. If you are in a, in a situation and you need to decide do I go left or right, you don't always have the time or the resources to get a full balanced picture. But sometimes in life we're just forced to act now or soon. So if you don't really know, we can always fall back to a compass that we have developed. That is, if we're, if we're really listening to it, then we know if we should be going left or right. That's what I would say as an additional statement. Um, the question, though, is, do you think a compass can develop over time? I think naturally it does but I also believe it gets set and once its direction is set, will, unless trauma occurs in our life, probably doesn't move so much. The needle doesn't go so far from the point. Because I always think of these values a bit like a, like a grid in Formula One. You know, depending on where you're looking at the race, depends on who looks like they're in front. And, you know, so I think that every now and then values can be aspirational or they can be core. And so for I think a lot of us, I know for me, I have some core values that I will not sway from. There is no movement. There's no negotiation. And there are some values that actually are aspirational. And depending on the circumstances, depending on what's happening, depending on who's involved, on the impact, the implications, on all those questions, maybe they're not as important as those core values. So I see values as a way of saying, you know, some people might have two or three core values. Nothing moves me from them. And maybe there's half a dozen values that are really important but depending on circumstances, they can be very important or not so important. Um, as, as an example, uh, I know that animals are a huge part of my life. So I, I love animals. I love being part of their life and having them in mind and my family. But if I was out with, say, two young kids and my dog, and I observed a group of youngsters maybe abusing their dog, throwing sticks, swinging, right. making it very aggressive. If I was on my own, I would go up to these people and say, hey, stop treating the dog in this way. And when I come home, I would tell people, hey, do you know what I did? I had this conversation today. I told these guys, these young kids, to stop behaving badly because my value is to look after the animals, to treat them nicely. But if I've got two young children with me, Am I going to take my two young children into this situation, which could create a confrontation? The security of my family becomes higher than my desire to protect this dog I don't know. And yes. so maybe I don't speak up. Or maybe I'm cross with myself. I didn't speak up. But my values are moving like this. Because yeah. the security of my family is the unmovable one. So I've always struggled with, with I don't know if this resonates, but... It, yes, 100%. Hard. Oh, God, 100%. Um, these are, this is, I think, the, the dynamic that happens where, you know, your compass is actually in an argument with, with itself uh -huh. um, when there's, there's no perfect choice. So sometimes, you know, it's, it's, that's, I think that's the struggle that often, very often happens if we at least think... We have to make a choice between, you know, the lesser evil or something like that. You know, then that, that becomes a morally very, very hard. But I think in most situations in, in, in life, also when it comes to, you know, leading yourself, um, this compass is uh, incredibly important. It's almost like an instinct, you know, that, that just kicks in, um, in in situations where you don't have much time to think. Now, with regards to developing your moral compass, is there, in your view, a way to do this deliberately, consciously? 
maybe it starts with having the awareness about what is mine anyway. I think we have to ask ourselves a question. What do you stand for? Or what won't you stand for? Maybe that's actually the, the first question. What will you not stand for? Because I, I was watching um, a movie called The Program recently. It's a story that David Walsh, the um, cycling journalist, brought to the world when he exposed Lance Armstrong as a blood doper in the world of the Tour de France. Now, if you asked Lance Armstrong in 1996 what his values were, he'd have said winning. And it was his desire to win that made him challenge the process <laughs> and find a way of doping his blood to create a higher ratio of oxygen in his blood to allow him to become the best through cheating. But his value was clear, completely clear. But at one moment he had that decision to make, right? Because he knew it was wrong. Yes. And he's moving like this. But he went this way, and for 10 years, he had to live a lie. The stress of living that lie, but he wanted to win. He wanted to be the best. And the only way he could do that was by cheating. So I'm wondering, when I'm watching this movie, you know, the journalist who was, you know, left out by his friends, dropped by his newspaper, he was challenging the process. He could see something wasn't right. His compass was telling him, I'm going to keep asking the question. And unfortunately for him, it took 10 years for it to come out when finally he was realized as the person who was the truthful one, the one with the value. So how do we ask this question? What do you stand for? And if I ask a 16 year old, what do you stand for? Do they know? If you ask a 20 year old, do they know? I think our values shift and change through our life until we find a place where we're comfortable and we're maybe authentic in our skin. So it's, for me, it's, a, it's like a growing movie where we, by trial and error, we learn what we stand for. We just have to ask the question. And some people are designed to ask that question from a younger age. Some of us can reach our 40s and 50s and we still not even asked <laughs> the question. So we don't really know. And I think maybe the way to start thinking about this is to think about who do you value and respect? And what is it that they do that makes you value and respect them? And think that, this way yes, maybe yes, helps. Uh, sorry, didn't uh, mean to interrupt. Please say the last part again. No, I think this is the, the way that helps me start to think about what is it that I stand for? I think that's a tough question for someone young as 16. Sure. I have a, a slightly different suggestion to this. And I think it works, it, this can work when you're younger and I think it will also still work when you're older. And that is, I think your, your compass, your feeling of what's right and what's wrong is mostly developed through experiences as you, that you make over time in your life, that you make or, or that you observe others make. Um, and from there, you probably develop a view on, hold on, <clears throat> from there, you probably develop a view on what's, what's good. That's a behavior that I want to copy that kind of, and your actions kind of in the end, they make you right. So they kind of create your identity. So I think when you're, as you're growing up when you're 16, 18, 20, 25, I think it's worth looking back at the decisions that you have made. And just ask yourself, did this have a good outcome for myself and for others and the situation as a whole? And based on this, was that the best decision to make? And maybe from that you learn that, that you go like, yeah, I think I did the right thing under the circumstances with the given information and so on. But I think there's also a quite a big probability that when you reflect, that in some situations you would say, no, I think I had myself in mind exclusively with that behavior or, my, um, or, or the, th the way I acted. Maybe if I get to a situation like this next time, I want to make sure 
nobody else gets hurt on the way. Maybe that's, that's how you develop a compass because you need to look back and how your actions have actually produced results, not only for yourself, but also for the world around you, what do you say? No, I, I, I sense you're right. But again, when I'm listening to that question, I think, wow, I'm trying to think of how young people would reflect in such a way that would create that kind of self-awareness. Um, because self-awareness comes from experience, of course. And I still think, you know, going back to your first point, these are hard questions. Oh, yeah. How, how was I, how did I show up in that moment? What was my motivation in that moment? What can I learn from that moment? You know, what was my goal there? What was I trying to achieve? What did I learn about that situation? What would I do differently next time? This idea of really kind of self-reflecting very deeply to unpick some themes that come out. Um, we could help uh, create a, an entire generation of real, real lovely, reflective young people. But I know some people my own age who would struggle maybe even with some of those questions. Oh, well, yeah. But it, how it's did not I show up, right? No, it's of course not easy. But look, it's, it's like everybody knows that, you know, a fundamental skill of leadership is also the ability to give feedback, right? So... As we're talking today about how you can actually lead yourself, that's a skill also you can apply to yourself. You can give yourself feedback. Right. And also, to be honest, even without asking, the world around you is giving you feedback too. <laughs> yes, you just have to be aware of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You have to just have to be aware of it. So I think that's, that's if, you're, if you're somebody, it doesn't actually matter if you're 16 or, or, or 40. It really doesn't matter. But I think the question to ask is, Am I looking back on my decisions and experiences and results? And how would I give feedback to myself for this? I like that last bit, right? You know, looking back on myself with regards to how would I give feedback to myself? Yeah. Uh, on what I did there, how I acted, how I showed up. Because then you can start thinking, and maybe that's the bridge to the question, which is, and actually, when I look around at my peers, my family, at people in society, uh, who do I look to where I think, wow, the way they act, I'd love to be like that. Not to be that person, but to act like that, to have that kind of integrity or that kind of honesty or that kind of self-reflection. Yeah. I think then maybe we, we kind of almost connect these questions where you start by looking in the mirror and saying, hey, how did I show up? What feedback am I going to give myself? And then once you've done that, you then need to look forward and say, but how do I want to be moving forward? It's those two parts. Yes, that's a good yes. one. And in addition, the good thing is from there, it leads to a clarity about what you want. So let's say we've got the clarity. We've looked back and we've looked forward and we've got some clarity now that building this moral compass. So we start to live by this moral compass. What comes next? What, what other behaviors do we need that can shine a light on leading the self yeah i think there's going to be instantaneously even if you have a compass and some clarity instantaneously you will begin to tell yourself also reasons why you know maybe changing or flexing your behaviors is not possible because there are all kinds of restriction there's the things there's a way things are done at least you've been taught so so you have to apply the next leadership skill which is challenging the process right and that also sounds a lot easier <laughs> than it is because that suggests that every time we walk through life and we're in, involved in a situation we ask questions like you know why are we doing it this way why does it have to be that way how come how right. else can we do it again it's that it's that self-awareness piece how, how have you how have you challenged the process in in your own life Frank, maybe we can learn something from how you've challenged process. Yeah, well, in, you know, let's talk about internally, right? So about myself and not in, in, in my environment. So challenging the process comes from, I think, realizing that continuing to do something the way it's always been done or is expected is actually creating a level of pain or hurt or discomfort. You have to admit that. 
and then begin to imagine, I mean, it's like a quick recipe, begin to imagine how could it actually be different? Is there a way to, you know, keep going somehow with some improvements or changes that, you know, don't create loads of new problems in which I can actually, do, will not have this discomfort anymore in that process. Um, it's not always possible to change without creating other dynamics that you still have to deal with. Some decisions that you need, that you make have consequences that can be felt by you or by someone else. But again, if it's based on what's your moral compass, I think then fr from that you can find the strength to go through with it. Yeah, and it, I guess it relies on the fact that we always have a choice. We have to care enough to want to ask that question. Right. Let's make it, let's make it a little bit more um, tangible with maybe one or two examples of what we even mean by challenging the process. Okay. So when we were uh, talking a little bit earlier, we had, you know, this example, it can be as simple as every, everybody around you was telling you because you're a girl, there are certain things professionally that you should, you should not be doing. Right. But if you feel inside of you that it's the, the thing that you want to do or that interests you or something like that, at one point you have to challenge your process. That's also going to be to some part, because when you were little, people telling you that's a no-go area, you actually start to believe that. Yeah. You know? And uh, getting beyond that is, um, is how you challenge the process also for yourself. Do you have another example? Well, I, I have a great example of my niece, actually. She's 19 years old. Uh, she left the UK to live in another country uh, 15 months ago and signed up. So went and, and, and moved countries uh, and emigrated and she wanted to join the army. Uh, a girl joining the army. Okay. We live in a, in a free enough world for her parents to go. Okay. But she wanted to become a sniper. Why? And girls don't become snipers in the military. And she was told what she needed to do in order to, and she was like, but why not? My eyesight's fine. I'm great with a gun and a rifle. So she just challenged the process over and she kept asking her superiors, why not? What do I need to do then? If I can prove to you that I can do this, this and this, why wouldn't I be accepted? And in the end, four or five weeks ago, maybe three, four or five weeks ago, she qualified as a sniper. She was given her gun and uh, she now is a sniper in the military um, and that's because she challenged the process because a year ago when she signed up for the military she was told that what she wanted to be wasn't possible but she'd been brought up by her parents to always ask why not yeah what do i need to do to make that happen two questions why not and what do i need to do to make that happen and yeah. those questions have helped her achieve exactly what she and she she posted a picture you know in her private group holding her gun she is like beaming now whether or not you agree with military interventions and this kind of life that's not for the debate for me the proof is this idea of how someone who's 19 years of age has challenged a process in a male dominated world as a female and achieved exactly what she wanted to achieve by pushing the boundaries and finding out through her questions what she needed to do in order to achieve what she wanted. So she had her moral compass, she had her clarity, and then she challenged the process to get what she wanted. And I, for me, that's like a lovely example of the first two elements we've been talking about in someone actually quite young. Yes, and it, it was, I think the key moment here is that's translatable to everything else with regards to challenging the process for yourself is you have to ask this question, uh, why not? Uh, on all of the assumptions that you have. So let's say you can, you're saying you can't swim. We have never learned it, but you sort of believe you, I can't swim. Or, you know, any sort of achievement that you think is not possible for yourself, for some reason, you need to ask, well, why not? You know, 
And more often than not, I think you'll discover at least after a while that um, you, you were you know, more or less telling this yourself. There's, there's very little that if there's you know, the required amount of talent and ability, if it exists, there's very little that you can't do. Right, and listen, we've, we've talked before, haven't we? You know, sometimes yeah. there comes a point in, in life where a lack of skill can get in the way of a dream. Yeah. So you can ask why not, and you can do all the training, and ultimately a lack of skill will prevent you from achieving. But yes. it doesn't prevent you from trying. No, 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 and exactly. And I mean, the why not question can give you back a good reason why not. Right. You know, I'm not saying that you know, everything makes sense to do. You know? It's just that... I think there are, there are so many aspects of our lives where we, for some reason, believe that we can't go there. Mm-hmm. And it's actually not true. I mean, let's say there's actually no concrete reason as to why we wouldn't be able to go there. No, completely. And listen, uh, psychologists call it uh, self-efficacy. And some people have what's called really low self-efficacy. They genuinely don't believe they can do things. They don't challenge the process. So, yes. for example, um, I come to you and I say to you, hey, Frank, there's a job going in another team in the business. Are you interested? It's two steps up for you. And you'll be like, no, Brad, I, c- I couldn't do that. Low self-efficacy. You don't think, for whatever reason, your upbringing, your training, your teaching, whatever, you don't believe you can do it. So you don't challenge the process. There are some people with really high self-efficacy and it's like, hey, Frank, did you hear there's, there's that job going? And you're like, yeah, 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 I've gone for it. I put my name down and it's like, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and you challenge the process. Listen, it might be that it, you, know, you get it or it might be that you know, a lack of skill gets in the way. So this idea of self-efficacy, it's, it's how we feel about ourselves. And for me, this is the real pivot point, the foundation point to challenge the process, to ask that question, why not? And what can I do to make it happen requires me to believe in myself. Yes. And that is the hard bit. And you know what? I want to compliment this with believe in yourself, but then also it's, it's not a problem if something doesn't work out. Maybe you figure, maybe you find out, okay, that was a step too high for, in, in one go. Okay, then you adjust your course. But if you never try and always believe this is my place and that's my, my little universe and I cannot expand it, then it will never happen. You know, lo- a lot of people are really afraid of losing um, in their own eyes or in the eyes of others and so on. But then in the end, when you look back at your life, the moments that you lost or let, didn't achieve a certain thing as you were imagining it in the beginning, did it hurt you or did it advance you? Undoubtedly, we learn more from those moments than we do from constantly winning. My point. So that's, the, that's what I would compliment it with. Just a, be a bit yeah. courageous. Courageous yeah. is actually also a really good segue. I'll let you say your thought. I can see you have one. No, uh, No, I think I think it was what you just said actually that made me think. Actually, challenge the process in brackets. We need to have courage to challenge the process. And there we are. This was exactly what I was going to say to maybe the last point in this particular um, episode about enabling yourself to act. Mm. I think this it really transitions from challenging the process over to finding the courage or be, you know, be brave in that moment to actually change, to actually do something. That is the, and, and I believe that's, that's a, a point where a lot of people stop. So they have their moral compass, you know, what's right or wrong for them. Uh, they're, they're, they have clarity on what they want. They are challenging the process in themselves, but then finding the courage to actually do something that is a whole different story. There is billions of personal development uh, posts on Instagram, for example. Billions of posts of it. But it 
it, it, so many, millions of people are trying to somehow, I think, to work up the courage of actually doing this step that whatever they want to do. Yeah. But then they don't. I think that most of them actually in the end don't. I would argue it's the hardest part. Because it's the leap of faith, Frank. It's a leap of faith to have courage. Because courage in in ourselves when we haven't practiced it it's a muscle memory that hasn't been developed we need to exercise that muscle in our brain that says we have courage if we don't ever try it we reinforce the fact that our muscles don't know how to do it but if we do it once and then we do it twice and then we do it three times suddenly it becomes muscle memory it becomes a new habit it's that courage to change starting small some people we've talked about in in our anxiety episodes you know where they they like to please people they they always say yes to things yeah so for them having courage to challenge the process and enable themselves to act would be to learn how to say no no i can't do that for you right now i'm so sorry i'd love to help but i can't this time this would be a leap of faith from them yeah. to not sit there and go, yes, of course I can do that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and in their head, they're going, no, why did I do that again? Yeah. Or as a family, um, maybe there's an argument going on and you want to stop the argument and you say, hey, guys, don't talk to each other like that. That's really unpleasant. But instead, you stay quiet. You need courage to speak up in the moment. You need courage to act in the moment and enabling is all about taking action creating an environment for yourself where it's safe to take that leap of faith to close your eyes and to jump into the chasm and say i might fail it's okay there's no net so i might fall and i might get hurt because you talked before about people don't like to fail don't like to lose right and I think it's actually even more than that. I think people don't want to feel the feeling of failure, feeling hurt. They don't want that hurt. Yeah. It scares yeah, yeah, them. Absolutely. Look, I think um, in, a, in, a, in a practical, oh, semi-practical way, I would say we always in situations like this where we have to decide to act or not, we make a little bit of a risk assessment in, internally for ourselves. You know, if I would act now, if I would speak up now, if I would do this now, if I would quit my job, find a new one, whatever decision it really is, we make a bit of a risk assessment. It's very subjective. It's about, um, on the one hand side, you have the things that you could potentially gain. On the other hand side, you have the things that you potentially lose. Now, one way to hack this equation a little bit towards courage is reducing your sense of what is there to lose. Mm -hmm. I think you need to really spend a little time on thinking, on questioning this, having a why question or what question about what do you actually lose on this side of the scale if things would go wrong or not in the way that you were hoping for. Maybe a little pointer for that. I think back in our earlier episode about happiness, I don't know if it was the first or the second. Um, when you were, we said when you're happy with nothing, then you actually have total liberty. <clears throat> and I think people are, are afraid of losing uh, things that maybe in the end are not so really so important. Yeah. You know, and if you, but if you know that you're pretty much invincible with regards to your, your happiness, you have, it's much easier to have courage. You know, this, this side of the scale just doesn't drag you down so much. And being aware, again, I suppose it goes back to the first point about, you know, asking yourself, how did I show up? A clarity. It's being able to have the clarity of what you might lose. And I think often all we lose is a little bit of pride. Yeah. It's ego. Ego is the enemy. Yes, I would agree. That, that's, I mean, okay, let's say there's also, that is almost always in the equation in some shape or form. The ego is always with you in that equation. 
not wanting to downplay that there are also actual risks and, and components that might happen, depends on the situation, of course. But I would argue that if more people would actually spend some time asking, what am I actually losing? Then this weight becomes less. That's what I'm... Because, I'm... because they realize that it's not so much or that they, they can afford to lose something. Yeah, yeah, precisely. precisely. Yeah. So we have three key behaviors here. We have finding that clarity through values and a moral compass to help us lead ourselves. This helps us challenge the process and we've created a caveat to that because it's actually about having the courage to challenge the process, asking why, why not, and what can I do to move forward? And then when we have the answers to those questions, it's then about creating the environment to enable ourselves to take action and move forward as a leader. I think those three elements are a really neat encapsulation of, of how we start to lead ourselves. Yes, that is a very good summary. I don't want to add anything. <laughs> uh, that's just a natural <laughs> point to say, end of session.